Greetings this Friday afternoon, at least in the Eastern time zone. It's Danny Hai Fong, and I am joined by Margaret Kimberly. How are you doing, Margaret, this I'm afternoon? Doing, I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day in New York. It is a beautiful day out here in the East Coast. Well, uh, we should get started because we have a lot to talk about. We have a great guest for you all today. Uh, it is Dr. Gerald Horn. He's the author of more than 30 books. And he recently wrote an article for Black Agenda Report on March 2nd, which I will bring on the screen here, From Crisis to Catastrophe, What is to be Done in Eastern Europe? So I'm going to bring that on the screen, and then we can bring Dr. Horn here. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, Actually, let's just bring Dr. Horn in, and then we will get. I'll share the screen. All right, hi, Dr. Horn. How are you doing today? Well, it's all good. What about you? Oh, I am doing all right. I'm doing all right. Okay, well, let's get started. You did write this article, which I'll bring on the screen once you begin talking. I, I want to get your reaction to this ongoing Ukraine crisis. I mean, it is. Still happening. Uh, Russia is still conducting its military operation. And uh, as you know, there has been a lot said and a lot of misinformation. So uh, you wrote this article from Crisis to Catastrophe. Uh, what is to be done in Eastern Europe? Uh, could you talk about what you uh, had to say in that article and just your general reactions to the crisis? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a very perilous moment in, that we face. Uh, what's happening is that we may be on the verge of World War III. And if you listen to certain commentators from Eastern Europe, particularly from Ukraine, they say we are in the embryonic stage of World War III. I think that it's important to gain a bit of historical perspective with regard to this crisis. And this is what I wrote in the article you just flashed on the screen. I think it's important to divide the relations between the North Atlantic Bloc and Russia into three segments, uh, pre-1917, 1917 to 1991, and post-1991. Now, as I say in that article, if you look at your map, you'll quickly acknowledge and recognize that Russia is the most, has the most territory on the European continent, it has the most resources, be it gold, petroleum, natural gas, titanium, which is necessary for the construction of airplanes. And it's the most populous nation on the continent as well, uh, almost twice the size of number two nation, now known as the Federal Republic of Germany. And so that created a contradiction for many Western European nations because as they began sailing south to plunder Africa, and West to plunder the Americas, becoming alleged world powers, they did not necessarily dominate their own backyard, speaking of the European continent, and that led Napoleon about 200 years ago to try to resolve this contradiction by invading Russia and being soundly defeated. And then you had the so-called Crimea War a few decades later with Britain and, London, uh, and Paris uh, principally ganging up on Russia. And then in a turning point in world history, in 1904, you have London finance the Japanese attack on Russia, which Du Bois, Ho Chi Minh, Nehru of India, Sun Yat-sen of China all saw as a turning point in world history insofar as it represented an Asian nation defeating, uh, quote, European nation, speaking of Russia, uh, which seemed to go against the predicates and suppositions of white supremacy, but it did lead directly to the Russian Revolution. It led also to the knockout blow delivered by uh, Japan against the British Empire by seizing its cash cows of Hong Kong and Singapore in 1941-1942. And so, as I say in that article, in, in some ways, uh, Russia is metaphorically akin to the whale in Moby Dick, Herman Melville's novel, insofar as yeah. Captain Ahab is the North Atlantic countries who are being driven to self-destruction, crazed self-destruction, uh, in pursuit uh, of this gigantic country, uh, speaking of Russia. 
However, Russia was not standing still as these plots were unfolding because it decided early on that it should attack its Western European antagonists at the root of their power, which was colonialism. And so even the New York Times, if you read the New York Times a few days ago, their correspondent in Johannesburg, who I hope I'm not getting him in trouble by not speaking ill of him, but uh, he was reporting about the fact that in the, quote, global south, unquote, there's not as much uh, enthusiasm about the sanctions regime, this boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Russia that has been inaugurated in recent weeks. And he pointed out that in another turning point in world history, the battle in what was then Abyssinia, now Ethiopia in the 1890s, where the Africans repelled an Italian invasion, that there were volunteers on the ground from Russia. And of course, I had reported previously that Russia had armed the Abyssinians uh, to the teeth to repel the Western European invaders. And we all know that, that is, there's a continuity because during the Soviet period, 1991 to 1917 to 1991, we know that the uh, Soviet Union uh, backed uh, African liberation. That's the substance of my book, White Supremacy Confronted, which deals with the struggle to liberate Southern Africa from apartheid uh, and colonialism. Uh, and indeed, uh, current and recent research is revealing I hope our black nationalist friends pay attention to this comment, <laughs> that uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, the Jamaican who founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association uh, about 100 odd years ago, was certainly uh, pro-Lenin, uh, pro-Soviet, uh, even after it seemed as if he were getting in hot water with the US authorities after they indicted him. And that's a subject for another discussion of why that particular facet of the Garvey program is not necessarily replicated by those who claim to be his ideological descendants. And this brings us to the 1991 to 2022 period, because what's striking uh, I think if, if we're able to survive World War III is that many scholars, at least the legitimate ones, may look back with wonder and wonder and puzzle over of why there hasn't been more self-criticism, <laughs> perhaps the question answers itself, uh, amongst uh, bourgeois commentators. I mean, for example, the United States spent trillions of dollars to dislodge the Communist Party from power in Moscow, mm -hmm. and now there are non-communists, obviously, in power, the United Russia Party, and yet now we're on the verge of World War III. You would think that somebody might say, well, may wait a minute, maybe it was a mistake to spend trillions dislodging the communists. Perhaps we didn't think through the contradictions of European history that I've just pointed out. Uh, with regard to this uh, historic contestation between Russia uh, pre-1917 and the Western European nations during that same era. But I guess it's asking too much uh, to ask for a bit of self-criticism. But in any case, we know that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the spearhead of this bellicosity, uh, came into existence in 1917, excuse me, 1949, pardon me, uh, on an explicitly anti-Soviet basis, you would have thought when the Soviet Union disappeared in 1991 that NATO would disappear. But instead, in their, quote, wisdom, unquote, the North Atlantic countries decided that they would incorporate <laughs> Moscow's, the Soviet Union's former allies into NATO, including such statelets as Montenegro and North Macedonia, <laughs> And under the concept of interoperability, what that means is they have to devote a significant part of their treasury to buying weapons from Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, the former home of uh, Pentagon chief uh, Lloyd Austin. And uh, then, of course, it, it creates this kindling that now has erupted with regard to this conflict. Now, I think 
that uh, in the quote global south unquote one of the reasons why there hasn't been as much enthusiasm as opposed to in the north atlantic bloc because despite all of this uh, blathering and bloviating about supposedly the world is united uh, against Russia. Actually, it is remarkable, and I wish they'd be more specific. It is remarkable that there is striking pan-European unity uh, with regard to this crisis. Uh, even Switzerland has overthrown its historic neutrality uh, to join the boycotters, the divestors, and the sanctions imposers. And even Monaco, uh, has, in a sense, joined uh, this particular venture as well. That's worthy of commentary because uh, many have come to think that the ultimate victor with regard to this crisis will, in the short term and long term, will be the People's Republic of China. And it's quite remarkable that on the eve of February 24, 2022, the inauguration of uh, this special military operation uh, in Ukraine by Russia, that we were marking the 50th anniversary of the Entente between China and the United States on an anti-Soviet basis, uh, in a sense replicating 1904 with the London uh, financing of, of the Japanese attack on Russia. And of course that created this juggernaut in the People's Republic of China. And now part of the non too hidden agenda is to use this crisis uh, in Eastern Europe to turn the tables on China because as the conversation, two hour conversation, by the way, between President Xi and Biden today, March 18, 2022, tend to suggest that Washington thinks it has China in a corner. Either A, China will go along with these sanctions against Russia, which of course do not have the imprimatur of the Security Council where both Russia and China have a veto and therefore you're basically asking uh, China to go along with these uh, sanctions that do not have the authority of international law, which will then in turn weaken China's major partner to the detriment of China. Or B, if China doesn't go along with these sanctions, then Washington will try to encourage the European Union, which, by the way, uh, has fallen flat on its face during this crisis, uh, encourage the uh, newly inaugurated uh, leader of South Korea, President Yoon, a certified hawk, uh, and other members of the so-called Quad, India, United States, Australia, Japan, to tighten the noose around China. And so that this competitor to... North Atlantic imperial hegemony, not to mention white supremacy, uh, could then be weakened and perhaps toppled along with toppling the regime in Moscow. Now, that's the fever dream, the wet dream, if you like, uh, in the corridors of power in Washington. Uh, whether or not it will come to fruition is another question. You know, thank you so much for that uh, that background, Dr. Horn. You know, these these fever dreams, as you call them, uh, to me, are just insane. Um, it, for you, you um, made mention of uh, 50 years ago, Nixon, the old Cold Warrior, the Red Vader going to China, meeting with Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai. Uh, and now um, we see an administration that seems to be terribly in incompetent, to your point about the lack of self-criticism, who have brought Ru China and Russia together. So the goal then was to keep China and Russia separated. That has been a foundation of US foreign policy. Don't let them become friends, except everything that the US has done, including the 2014 coup in Ukraine, has brought China and Russia closer and closer together. And so we see headlines today that the US is going to tell China, you can't side with Russia and you have to join us, which of course is suicide. Um, oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> that's suicidal for China because they need their friendship with Russia. And if Russia loses here, then China knows that they are next. So there's, there's so many other ways that we could talk about this inexplicable or seemingly inexplicable behavior on the part of the U.S. in this entire crisis. Um, uh, the, the fever dream of fantasy, I call it fantasy foreign policy. 
and we are all um, uh, its victims living on a, a knife edge. Um, we see people in Washington who should be fired. I guess Biden would have to fire himself. So at, at any rate, what do you, what do you think about these these uh, these all of the actions that the Biden administration has undertaken, which have led to this happening? And seemingly, I guess not seemingly, they want this to continue. The last thing they want is uh, the best thing for the rest of the world, which would be negotiations. What what are your thoughts on 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 that? Well, first of all, with regard to your earlier point, uh, so-called geopolitical strategists in the United States of America, they have this idea and have held it for decades that whoever controls the world island, the world island being the territory stretching from Lisbon on the west of Europe to Vladivostok on the east facing the Pacific, basically is in control of planet Earth. And right now, with the rise of the United Russia Party in Moscow and the Communist Party in China, the North Atlantic bloc, with the United States taking the baton from the British Empire post-1945, is far distant from controlling the world island. And so from their point of view, this present crisis in Ukraine presents a marvelous opportunity to reverse the tides of history by engaging in regime change in both Moscow and in Beijing, uh, two nuclear powers. Uh, and this ties in to your other point, that is to say the politics of Washington, D.C., because the Democrats led by Joe Biden have been able to outflank many of the Republicans on the right with their belligerence and bellicosity and their warmongering. Mm -hmm. Republicans do not like to be outflanked on the right. They feel that that is their territory. In fact, they have an informal slogan of no enemies on our right that helps to shed light on their playing footsies with neo-Nazis in Charlottesville and elsewhere, uh, not to mention uh, in the Donbass in uh, Eastern Ukraine. And so what's happening now is that many of them, not all of them to be sure, but many of them are scrambling to outflank Biden on the right. I would point particularly to uh, Senator Rick Scott of Florida, mm -hmm. who is now in a traffic jam in his home state because a number of Floridians plan as he does to run for president, including Agent Orange, Donald J. Trump, Marco Rubio, little Marco Rubio, uh, as Mr. <laughs> Trump has called him, and of course, uh, the windbag, Governor DeSantis. And so he has to distinguish himself somehow uh, in his home state, not to mention nationally. So he's not only calling for the latest harebrained scheme coming out of Washington, which is a no-fly zone, uh, which could involve uh, United States and NATO uh, shooting Russian planes out of the sky over Eastern Europe, uh, which could trigger uh, World War III. But he's also talking about transferring jets, uh, fighter jets, uh, to the battlefield, either through Poland or Romania or Moldova or Slovakia. By the way, I noticed that when you had this uh, stage-managed uh, meeting, supposedly in the Ukraine, although there's contestation about that, uh, involving uh, leaders of other Eastern European states, such as Poland and Mr. Mm -hmm. Zelensky, that there was talk about transferring this S-300 uh, missile defense system that M Moscow has developed uh, to Ukraine, but that would go against the end user certificate, it would be violative of the law, not that these mm -hmm. NATO allies observe the law in any case, but I think that it, that it is a non-trivial detail uh, that should be mentioned. In any case, um, this has led to this bidding war in Washington with one uh, party trying to outflank the other. It's utterly dangerous. Uh, it's opening the gates of hell. Uh, hopefully, our peace movement will be strapping on their boots and taking to the streets because uh, 
we have not seen the likes of this crisis, uh, I dare say, in years. And there's one more point I should add, which is that right now, believe it or not, the fate of the planet may be hinging on the interpretations of lawyers, which is quite unfortunate, to put it mildly. What I mean is the State Department lawyers in Washington, D.C., their theory of the case is that Washington cannot be considered a co-combatant, a co-belligerent, even though it's transferring an arsenal to mm -hmm. the battlefield, including Stinger missiles, which were so effective in Afghanistan, including Javelin anti-tank missiles, small arms, ammunition, machine guns. Now, uh, presumably, they think that their counterpart legal eagles in Moscow agree with them because if they don't agree and the Moscow legal eagles say, no, 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 you're a co-combatant, you're co-belligerent. Well, then that allows uh, Moscow to attack that co-belligerent, uh, which means these U.S. forces who are just over the border in Poland, for example, not to mention uh, on the ground uh, in Ukraine itself, and speaking of being on the ground in Ukraine itself, uh, we are already constructing the next nightmare as the present nightmare is unfolding. I guess you could say that's a perverse form of optimism, that they must feel the world is not going to come to an end, so they're already constructing the next nightmare. W what I mean is that they say that they're going to make another Afghanistan for Moscow, out of Ukraine. You recall Afghanistan, I'm sure, in the 1980s, the United States made this de facto alliance with religious zealots, uh, which not only helped to weaken the former Soviet Union, but then backfired uh, with the, at least this is what we're told, with regard to the attacks on New York and Washington in September 2001. <laughs> but it also created havoc uh, in North Africa. Many of the religious zealots who were attracted from Algeria then came back to Algeria and raised holy hell. The same holds true for Yemen. One of the problems in Yemen, uh, which is now being bashed by the Saudis, is that many of the Yemeni fighters who came to Afghanistan then came back and weakened uh, the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, uh, southern Yemen and Aden, which was one of the few, if not the only, socialist-directed uh, regimes in the Arab world. And now, of course, the Yemen is on fire. So we already have these press reports of these legions of Euro-Americans and other Europeans who are flooding into Ukraine, presumably will gain skill and talent in fighting guerrilla wars, and then a la Afghanistan and Algeria, or Afghanistan and Yemen, will then flood back home to the United States, uh, to Western Europe, uh, where they will then unleash their grotesque uh, skills and talents, quote unquote, on the rest of us. Uh, already, uh, there is a foundation for that because we already know about the pre-existing strength of the right wing in the United States of America, in Western Europe, where it's taken uh, even more toxic form in the, <clears throat> in the sense of the alternative for Germany party in uh, Berlin, uh, in terms of Eric Zemmour, the uh, right winger who is contesting for the presidency of, of France and has attracted significant support according to recent polls. So as I said, they're constructing the next nightmare, uh, even though the current nightmare uh, has yet to be terminated. So obviously it behooves all of us to work overtime uh, to dislodge these miscreants from power uh, they forfeited uh, any credibility that they may have had. And certainly it's in our self-interest to make sure that they're no longer around to construct the next nightmare. Yeah, I mean, those are uh, really good points. And this whole notion of a no-fly zone over Ukraine has been quite striking for me. And the fact that the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, who Vladimir Zelensky, who was elected on the premise that he would de-escalate and demilitarize the country as it was 
embattled in a civil war still is that's a huge part of this current crisis is the fact that ukraine has been bombarding and shelling eastern ukraine donbass for seven eight years now uh, to with the, to the detriment of tens plus thousand lives but nonetheless this whole idea of a no-fly zone as you said it really does risk world war three it's both the risk of shooting down russian forces in the air but also russia is a military power it has anti-aircraft missile uh, weapons which can also fire back and that would mean also if article 5 of nato's so-called constitution is triggered that would mean that russian territory itself would be uh, ripe for a, a strike of of many kinds and so i think that just shows how dangerous the situation is right now and as you said you know where is the peace movement in all of this and i would like to if you could comment on on that question right where is the peace movement and maybe if you could give a bit of history about you know how has russia been looked upon by uh, the peace movement i know that you've written extensively on du bois and robeson could you talk about you mentioned in the article right there was this period where in order to gain concessions in the jim crow you know against jim crow there was an abandonment of this uh, peace orientation, this internationalist orientation that was held by the likes of Robeson. Could you talk about that and what lessons we could learn today for the current peace movement? Well, point number one, uh, I made a critique of some of our representatives in Washington, D.C., uh, singling out Senator Rick Scott and President Biden. I could have extent, expanded uh, and extended my remit easily, I'm afraid to say, to some members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And of course, uh, our co-host Margaret Kimberly has been waxing upon that uh, quite a bit uh, of late. Even Barbara Lee, uh, who stood tall in 2001 with regard to the crisis in Afghanistan, has decided to throw in her lot, I'm afraid to say, along with other members of the Congress Congressional Black Caucus uh, with the warmongers. Now, on the one hand, as your prefatory comments suggested, we can see this as flowing inevitably from what I call the Compromise of 1954, whereby in return for anti-Jim Crow concessions, the tallest trees in our forests, who tended to be of the left, uh, were isolated, persecuted. W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, at the age of 83 in 1951, is handcuffed and tried criminally for being the agent of an alleged foreign power, uh, unnamed foreign power, I should say. That foreign power, not mentioned in the indictment, is the people's, uh, is, is the Soviet Union, uh, because uh, Du Bois was advocating uh, banning the bomb, banning nuclear weapons. And so that had to be a communist plot. And therein, you begin to see the crisis that emerges in the peace movement, because as was said during the battle days of slavery, you only need to beat one slave to keep the entire plantation in line. And so when you put a man of the eminence of W.E.B. Du Bois, who is a leader of the Peace Information Center uh, on trial, uh, this sends a signal <laughs> to the rest of the peace movement that if you veer too far out of line, uh, you too can be indicted. And unlike Du Bois, you won't be able to uh, get international press and <laughs> have the, the lawyers from the left, from the National Lawyers Guild, uh, come to your defense. Uh, you can look forward, I'm afraid to say, to a, a lengthy jail term. And the same holds true uh, for other people on the left, including Paul Robeson, who incurred the wrath of the U.S. authorities in 1950, 1951, when he filed a petition at the United Nations charging the U.S. with genocide against Black people. His income uh, plummeted from the six figures to the four figures. His passport was taken. Uh, he was finding it difficult to have concerts. Mm -hmm. His records were being taken out of uh, stores because, of course, as you know, he was a, a world-class uh, actor, singer, mm -hmm. intellectual, linguist, uh, etc. And this, this, of course, uh, only began to end uh, when uh, you had his friends in India uh, led by uh, Prime Minister Nehru began to uh, clamor against that sort of thing. And then let me mention one more point in, in this regard to link this directly to the Congressional Black Caucus, because 
Not so long ago, a leading light in the Congressional Black Caucus was Congressman George Crockett of Detroit, Michigan. Congressman Crockett came into prominence most directly in 1949 when he was the lawyer for the Communist Party in the what was then called the trial of the century, the trial of the Communist Party leadership. He was a lawyer for Ben Davis, uh, who had followed Adam Clayton Powell into the New York City Council in the Communist Party ticket, 1943 and 1945, then put on trial in 1949 and jailed by 1950, 1951. Crockett his defense of Ben Davis was so vigorous that he was jailed uh, after the trial. Uh, he served uh, months in federal prison on contempt of court. And of course, the court merited contempt. And so we see that this was the background of many members of the Congressional Black Caucus previously. Uh, I think, Margaret Kimberly, you mentioned that uh, Mr. Crockett's uh, fellow Detroiter, John Conyers, yes. before he passed away and left Congress, was railing against the Azov Battalion yep. of Ukraine, uh, which, of course, we know as a neo-fascist, neo-Nazi uh, formation. Congressman Ronald V. Dellums, to connect these threads, was the predecessor of Barbara Lee in the Congress of the United States representing Oakland, Berkeley, Congressman Dellums, the late Congressman Dellums, was known for his close camaraderie with the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. uh, his close friendship with Bobby Seale, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party, also from the San Francisco Bay Area. And we all know what happened to the Black Panther Party, uh, how they were subjected to murderous attack, uh, as represented most recently in the uh, Hollywood film Judas and the Black Messiah. And so... I guess you could say, if you wanted to factor in every element of the equation, that the Congressional Black Caucus of today did not have the benefit of the searing experiences of a George Crockett or Ronald V. Dellums. So perhaps we should not necessarily be shocked or surprised that they are wanting in 2022, although if you want to subject that point of view to criticism, saying I'm being much too charitable, <laughs> I won't object. Uh, they will have to defend themselves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, history, what's happened with Black politics, the way uh, and just to be frank, they've uh, been bought off. The, you know, There was a time when they were uh, left alone. Um, and then, uh, you know, as the, uh, as neoliberalism strengthened, and then they said, well, we can't leave these people over here unbought. And they decided who was and wasn't going to be elected, who would be defeated. And the end result is a, a black caucus that is pretty much like, uh, um, the rest of, of Congress. But anyway, but I had another, uh, question for you. You know, we all see the, war propaganda that we're being subjected to. I, I have no recollection of anything like this in my life, uh, where every uh, members of Congress are, you know, have blue and yellow flags and saying glory to Ukraine, while also claiming it's not really a fascist statement, even though it was. Um, so we have a population that has been deliberately dumbed down, um, depended upon corporate media, which works hand in hand with the state, so we have, uh, excuse me, a public who I don't think realize the danger that we're in. Um, we see members of the media uh, goading the Biden administration to, to war. Aren't you going to stand up to Putin? Are you, aren't you going to call his bluff? I, it's, it's horrible. So we have a public, um, you know, the anti-war movement is small, but the vast majority of people have been so indoctrinated. Um, what what are your observations um, uh, about that? This uh, overwhelming uh, indoctrination that has become accepted by the vast majority of people. Well, it's a complex question. As you know, uh, one of the subjects I've written on of late has been the origins of settler colonialism in North America, stretching back to the 16th century. And if you look at that embryo in the 16th century, one of the 
points that leaps out to you and that is stressed in my book, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, is that amongst the European migrants who are crossing the Atlantic uh, to settle, quote unquote, what they called North Carolina in the 1580s, that it's a multi-class formation and that uh, historically uh, settler colonialism in North America has operated on the principle of class collaboration between and amongst those of European descent. Uh, reconstructed as, quote, white, uh, eventually. Of course, this helps to uh, uh, leave their major competitor, speaking of Catholic Spain, flat-footed, because an axis of differentiation for Catholic Spain, of course, was religion. You could be a conquistador, an African, if you profess Catholicism. Uh, but with the transition from religion to, quote, race, unquote, or pan-Europeanism, if, if you like, uh, Britain was able to co-op Catholics. If you look at the history of, of Maryland, for example, it, it's basically started by Catholics in the midst of supposed uh, religious conflict. Uh, uh, Baltimore, uh, for example, the same. And so we shouldn't be overly surprised that uh, even in 2022, hundreds of years after the formation of settler colonialism, that uh, Class collaboration is still a, a fundamental tenet uh, with regard to the alleged and purported stability uh, of the United States of America. Uh, we all know, even contemporary analysts recognize, that since the Democratic Party in the 1960s seemed to be moving towards the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that they have not won a majority of the Euro-American electorate since then. 1991, David Duke, a Nazi and Klansman, uh, runs for governor of Louisiana. 1991, 1991, in the lifetime of many of your audience, and receives 55% of the Euro-American vote. And so these are difficult realities to either uh, absorb or accept. And so I find that most people try to sweep it under the rug. <laughs> which I sort of understand, except that now it, it, it's sort of catching up with this. And speaking of catching up with this, I, I, I do think we need to, uh, it's, it's not premature, it's not too soon to begin to do an analysis of uh, the victor, victors and losers with regard to this conflict. I think that uh, Ukraine certainly is a short-term loser and a long-term loser with regard to this conflict. The United States will probably be a, a short-term beneficiary and a long-term loser. What I mean by that is that in the short term, it seems as if they've been able to co-op the European Union, the giant with the feet of clay, uh, with uh, President Macron's uh, line about strategic autonomy of the European Union uh, going into the wastebasket, apparently. Uh, if this were an investment show on CNBC, I would be advising to buy the stock of Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, yeah. perhaps Boeing, uh, for example, because it's, it's, it's interesting in, in terms of collective wisdom. I noticed that the Germans rearming, which is one of the most frightening aspects of this whole escapade, they're deciding not to buy French jets, but U.S. fighter jets, which left me somewhat ba baffled. I, I don't know if that was a head fake a multi-million dollar head fake on their part, or I should draw some other inference from it, but it, it, it's really remarkable. But I think the European Union will be a short-term loser and a long-term loser unless they reverse course. They're going to have to deal with uh, an energized ultra-right wing, uh, per my comments about creating an Afghanistan in their backyard. They're going to have to deal with millions of refugees, and although we know that these Ukrainian, quote, blonde and blue-eyed refugees do not receive as, as much flack as those from North Africa and Western Europe, uh, inevitably, it seems to me, it's going to be a strain on the budget of Brussels and, and the various capitals. And then, in the pièce de résistance, they're being asked to join the new Cold War against China, their major market. They're being asked to find a new energy source other than Russia. And so now I saw these articles about they're thinking about building a pipeline from Nigeria up to the Mediterranean. And I was thinking, don't they read the newspapers? I mean, what do they think Boko Haram is going to say about that? And all these religious zealots they helped to fund in Burkina Faso and Mali and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere. So the, the European Union is in a real jam. And if there were any wisdom in the leadership, 
they'd be leading a fast break away uh, from Washington. Uh, China seems to be a short-term victor and a long-term victor. But of course, that's dependent upon uh, circumstances that are yet to unfold uh, concerning uh, this uh, anti-China alliance, uh, whether or not uh, the United States, uh, as they used to say in the old cowboy movies, might seek to get the drop on the chai comms by launching a preemptive strike against them because they won't go along with sanctions and they're funding uh, Russia's quote, adventurism, unquote, in Eastern Europe. But that, that seems to be the preliminary tally. But as I said, the, these events are unfolding at a fast and rapid rate. Yep. And uh, please allow me an opportunity to revise and amend uh, my prognostication as the situation might demand. Oh, for sure. I mean, this is moving very fast. And I, I think you're right that we, we don't have a crystal ball, but we can definitely see the current trajectory uh, where things are going. And it's very interesting you brought up how Ukraine refugees, refugees coming out of Ukraine are being portrayed in the mainstream Western media, especially as being blonde hair and blue eyed and as being worthy, unlike the millions upon millions of refugees from places like Libya, Yemen, and Syria, and et cetera, which the European Union had a heavy hand in helping create, as, along with uh, its imperial master in a lot of ways, the United States, and how they are being portrayed as unworthy and as being sort of deserving of their absolutely uh, destitute and a really horrific fate. But one interesting thing about this, I think you bring up a really good point about how these refugees are still going to create havoc for the economies and also the social life of these extremely racist countries. I mean, these countries have a huge race problem. The whole entire Western world right now is coming apart at the seams uh, in large part because these tensions continue to be stoked, continue to create uh, in re irreconcilable divisions in society. And all the while, you have the United States and the West claiming that Ukrainians are white, but they're not fast-tracking EU membership, and they're not fast-tracking NATO membership. They're keeping Ukraine as essentially what how it's been treated since 2014 and even before that, as a convenient launch pad, a sort of a vassal state, a weak country that can be super exploited by the U.S. and NATO for its larger aims, this new Cold War. I, I wonder what you think about this new Cold War generally. You made really good points about China and Russia and how they are very close to Europe. And so Europe is really in this bind because a lot of European countries have signed on to the Belt and Road. A lot of European countries rely on Russia as a huge market for energy. I mean, where is this new Cold War going to go if at the base, economically, Europe is sort of, I don't know, it, it's, it's caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, how can this new Cold War continue on in the U.S.'s liking, at least, when uh, some of its most uh, valuable allies in Europe uh, cannot help but be dependent on these growing powers of the East? Well, I think obviously we need new thinking in Brussels, uh, which may not be forthcoming, because obviously they're being played by Washington. Washington starts a brush fire in their backyard and then goes, hides behind that formidable border known as the Atlantic Ocean, and then gives counsel and advice. And uh, as I said, why the European Union, a market of 450 million, larger than the US capitalist market of 330 million, uh, bends the knee to the United States of America is, is somewhat baffling. Now, I, I know that the titular political leader of the EU, speaking of France, needs U.S. aerial and satellite assets to maintain its neo-empire in West Africa. That's the import of the ongoing crises in Burkina Faso and Mali, uh, amongst other places. But still, it, it is still staggering to contemplate how and why it is uh, that uh, this uh, crisis has unfolded. I should also say that with regard to Ukraine itself, the major player and how it's being manipulated, 
uh, it reminds me of how Britain uh, soared to prominence in the 16th century. Because as I say in that very same book that I mentioned a moment or so ago, uh, Britain became very adroit and adept at uh, getting other powers to fight its battles for it. Uh, for example, in the 16th century, when it was first getting started, uh, you saw that London was willing to fight Spain to the last Dutchman. And of course, if you had been around and say maybe 1610, you would have thought that the, the Dutch were on a glide path to being what the uh, British Empire turned out to be. But of course, they absorbed too many blows of fighting ultimately on behalf of London and were ultimately weakened. And so now you see that Washington is willing to fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian. And the Ukrainians, or at least the leadership uh, in power today, uh, seem to be willing to go along with it. But you also mentioned this question of the refugees and the racialized discourse that's encompassed them, uh, which I'm afraid to say is also ensnared Al Jazeera. I mean, I had Al Jazeera as part of my steady media diet until they decided to go along with this uh, utterly racist reporting. It, it, was, I was, it, it really doesn't make sense even from a marketing point of view, because if I want to listen to that sort of reporting, I don't need to go to Al Jazeera. I can MSNBC, CNN. So even from a, a profiteering point of view, it really doesn't make that much sense. And certainly, I think that that sort of reporting is a factor in one of the underlying issues of this entire conflict which is the reaction in the global south, how four dozen plus uh, nations at the General Assembly vote castigating uh, Russia either voted to abstain or did not show up. And this included uh, most of the nations of Southern Africa, including South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia, <laughs> Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and included Algeria and, and Senegal as well. And I think that for many in the global south, they've had it up to their keister with this hypocrisy of the North Atlantic bloc. Uh, that is to say, all of this blather about the first conflict on the European continent since 1945, sweeping under the rug <laughs> what happened in Yugoslavia, where, by the way, you may recall the United States punched China in the nose by destroying its embassy in Belgrade, a direct signal uh, to a rising China. Not to mention exceeding its mandate, United Nations mandate in Libya by moving to topple Gaddafi and engage in regime change, which utterly outraged the African Union, which was engaged in mediation efforts that were coming uh, to fruition uh, before the Obama-Biden team, uh, backed up by Samantha Power, Susan Rice, and Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, decided to exceed the mandate. And then, of course, that debacle in Afghanistan, uh, which was a NATO venture, uh, although I had thought, according to Mr. Stoltenberg, their leader, that this is a, an alliance that's focused on Europe and that is a, quote, defensive alliance. He seems to have that comment on speed dial. Obviously, he's forgotten about Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Libya, et cetera. And so the global South, uh, they, they've had it. And this is maybe part of the ironic good news because back to World War II, uh, many on the left, when, which for reasons that you could see it's legitimate, uh, found themselves on the same side as Washington. Uh, and Moscow fighting Germany and Japan, they thought that the that the leopard would change its spots, uh, that uh, this would mean going forward that uh, the lion would lay down with the lamb and imperialism had transformed itself. Many, many on the left, I've written about it, actually believe that. I, I don't think many people on the left today are saying because this boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement has taken flight with regard to Russia, that we can now expect it to take flight with regard to Israel. I, I, I don't hear too many people saying that. So that, that that's part of the good news. Whatever naivete uh, that may have been lingering on the U.S. left, I would hope and imagine uh, has dissipated, if not disappeared. Which brings me to my next point, which is that 
Pepe Escobar, who writes for Asia Times, had a piece the other day about in the midst of this crisis, uh, the EEU, the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, under the putative leadership of Moscow, uh, has now co-opted China. And there's this new block that's developing that if we can resolve the tensions between Delhi and Beijing could include India, which of course is now buying energy uh, from Russia uh, on a basis of sending rupees, the Indian currency, to Moscow, and then the trade going the other day, other way will be in rubles. You see that the Saudis are talking about trading oil with China uh, using the Chinese currency. We see that Washington sent a mission to Venezuela <laughs> in light of turning its back on Russian energy. Of course, that's outraged. Senator Rubio, Senator Menendez, and we'll have to wait and see what happens with regard to, to that venture. But in any case, all of these points reflect that a new international situation is uh, giving birth. And like with any birth, there are going to be birth pangs, I'm afraid to say. And that's an optimistic way, uh, perhaps an overly benign way, I'll, I'll grant you that, of lo looking at this current situation that we're in the midst of one of those rare events, a, a, a transition in the global correlation of forces that hopefully will be a benefit to humankind, unlike the correlation of forces it's hopefully replacing. You know, I, I, I do want to be optimistic and all the things that you just mentioned, those are all uh, very positive signs for the whole world. Um, that the, uh, the world is becoming more multipolar. Um, that's a good thing, that's what we need. Uh, but I, I have this lingering fear about my own country and how it will respond. Uh, we've talked about their incompetence, their inability to be self-critical. And um, I fear what their reactions will be. They veer from bellicosity to panic. So. Uh, in the case of Venezuela, they said Maduro wasn't even the president, and then they run down there hoping to get his oil. So these are not the smartest people, uh, uh, just to be blunt about it. And I, I just feel they are constrained by their uh, uh, history, by their fantasies, and how they will respond while the rest of the world behaves in a rational way, and everything you've just described is the rational outcome that we live in an irrational country. So uh, I don't know uh, if you have uh, uh, any, any thoughts about that. Well, also uh, keep in mind as well, and this is something I think we should trumpet on uh, like a gender report and other organs to which we have access. Uh, we need to ensnare our antagonists in their own contradictions. Mm -hmm. What I mean is despite this boycott, divestment and sanctions movement targeting Russia, which has taken off like a rocket in recent days, already you see the point that it does not encompass the third largest bank in Russia, which is Gazprom, which is tied to the natural gas behemoth, which sends natural gas to Germany and the other sites in Europe. And of course, the uh, I'm speaking to you from Texas, and the sound you might hear in the background is corks and champagne bottles popping as the those in the petrol metro are dancing in the streets at the prospect of capturing markets from Gazprom that they had not held heretofore. But interestingly enough, so Gazprom has this bank, the third largest bank in Russia, which finances all these transactions. It's not being boycotted. So don't be surprised that within months, Gazprom is the number one bank in Moscow. Likewise, uh, you've had uh, Exxon and BP uh, make quite a to-do about exiting Russia along with its uh, comrades and the Fortune 500, but that does not apparently encompass Total of France, the uh, energy giant of France. So uh, since these folks in the United States seem to be so hysterical, uh, about Russia. You know, they're boycotting Tchaikovsky, who died 
two centuries ago. They're boycotting Dostoevsky. Uh, we were told that we should have a wall between art and politics and sports and politics. But uh, concert singers and orchestra conductors are being made not just to denounce the war, but denounce Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll lose their jobs. So uh, we should ask them, uh, wh what do you think about uh, Gazprom Bank? I mean, I'm not saying you should extend, <laughs> but people need to be faced with the contradictions. I mean, they should be made, forced to answer. Uh, when are you going to get in, in Macron's grill about uh, Total, uh, for example? So I think that there are a number of opportunities uh, opening up for us uh, in the radical movement, the progressive movement, the peace movement. As one door closes, another opens. Uh, you know, the old saying about the uh, Chinese character of uh, peril uh, comprised of both uh, danger and opportunity. I think that obviously there's a danger we've uh, spent time talking about in terms of World War III, but there's an opportunity. Yeah. It, it seems to me uh, to play on these contradictions, to uh, attack our foes, to get them to own up. Because, you know, at these Ivy League universities, they have entire curricula on grand strategy, where, which are designed, quite frankly, to maintain U.S. hegemony forevermore. And now we're talking about U.S. hegemony being potentially jeopardized. So what happened to grand strategy? I mean, should these professors be criticized or should they engage in self-criticism? Should the curriculum be revamped? I mean, should they start to invite Margaret Kimberly and Danny Haifong to lecture? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Horn, yes. <laughs> well, so, I mean, the, these are the kinds of, kinds of questions uh, that we should be raising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the ensnaring, uh, uh, the Western imperial powers and their own contradiction sounds like a really good idea. And I think it gets to this, what this idea that I was thinking about as you were talking was how you know globalization over the past 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, it, there's a huge catastrophe portion to it, of course, especially what happened to Russia. But we know how the United States used it as an opportunity to expand its hegemony, the endless wars, the backbreaking austerity. But at the same time, what also happened over this period was there has been a real interconnectivity that has happened across the world and that countries like Russia and China, especially China in the economic realm, but even Russia, as we're seeing now, are deeply integrated in the overall global economy, making this new Cold War really suicidal for the United States and Europe in so many ways, for the U.S. and NATO in so many ways, yet they continue on in this very uh, confused manner in so in so many ways. We see how there's all of this bluster to try to isolate, starve, and hopefully regime change Russia. But at the same time, they are very keen on their hesitation about the no-fly zone request from Volodymyr Zelensky. So there is this really contradictory policy that's being undertaken in this new Cold War that does open up an opportunity to expose the political side of all of this. What are the politics involved and how do we intervene so that it isn't just the chorus of imperialism singing the song of uh, the day and singing the song of the moment, but that we can actually begin to write history. Because at the end of your article for Black Agenda Report, you say very, uh, very specifically that there are so many lessons to draw from this moment, but a better understanding of history and the international correlation of forces is a huge one, along with the collectives and the movements that we need to take advantage of these moments. Uh, I don't know if you want to close on that or and also just tell people where to find you as we end here well as is evident i'm not underground yet and let's keep our fingers <laughs> crossed and hopefully that won't have to happen but uh i would say that certainly the point that i would raise uh, until there's not a breath in my body is that our movement needs 
obviously to be more internationalized and globalized. Uh, that's how we are able to level the playing field with regard to the strength of the right wing uh, in this country, for example, because that is their Achilles heel. And the opposite of an Achilles heel is what we enjoy when we venture across borders and across oceans. I mean, uh, when we talk about slavery, for example, we know that it not only was able to be defeated because of internal struggle, but also there was external struggle. The Haitian Revolution in the first instance, 1791 to 1804, which ignites a general crisis in the entire slave system that could be resolved only with its collapse, not only in the United States, but in the Americas. With regard to U.S. apartheid, Jim Crow, we've made reference to the international pressure generated by Paul Robeson mm -hmm. and forces on the left by taking the United States before the internet, before the international community, uh, before the United Nations, uh, creating a dynamic, which even the U.S. Supreme Court acknowledges in its epical Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, making specific references to the point that the United States is losing credibility and altitude because of U.S. Jim Crow. And so uh, those particular dynamics have not disappeared or dissipated one iota. Uh, the international community uh, is our ally. It's our ally with regard, not only with issues regard to war and peace, our subject for today, but also with regard to combating police terror and combating these other ills that are afflicting our community. So uh, I assume our time is rapidly expiring. So I'd just like to thank you for inviting me uh, onto this program. And I look forward to engaging with you sooner rather than later. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, we will definitely need to have you on, especially as things develop. I get the sense that, regardless of what happens in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, that there will be a lot to talk about uh, with respect to everything that was uh, said and discussed here. Thank you, Dr. Horn, so much for coming on. Margaret and I are gonna stick around for a few more minutes, so please don't go anywhere, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I want to make sure you can see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was a great interview with Dr. Horn. Margaret Thanks. and I will stick around for another 15, 20 or so minutes. And I wanted mm -hmm. to stick around because so much was said. Mm -hmm. And uh, just make sure everyone is aware to keep sharing and liking the stream and boosting it. But uh, Margaret, I want to get your I want to get your opinion and analysis on the here and now, like what's happening right now in this conflict. There have been so many pretty small updates, but updates nonetheless. We've had ongoing negotiations between Russia and Ukraine, nothing really concrete coming out of them. Now you have China and the United States talking today. You had Xi Jinping and, mm -hmm. and Joe Biden having a phone conversation. Again, not, not really much in the way of concrete policies coming out of these conversations but what do you what is your opinion on how things are going with this conflict and, and what it means for us I, I definitely want to get your take on this well you know it's it's, it's interesting danny um i think uh, i have to think about the the time uh leading up to february 24th where the biden administration was constantly saying russia's going to invade they're going to invade and i was skeptical i did not think that that was going to happen um i think they I think we have to talk about the fact that they were, however, instigating something. They were instigating the Ukrainians to attack, excuse me, in the Donbass, which they were doing, which uh, is why uh, Putin gives that as his reason for going in. And I think that is true. But uh, so we have this administration. That's my, I'm, I'm focusing that on that a lot, I know, who don't know what they're doing. They aren't even smart in their evilness. You know, they um, wanted something to happen. They got something. So they wanted to kill the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. They got that. They wanted sanctions on Russia. They got that. But they also got more than they bargained for. And um, <clears throat> I think that whatever happens militarily in Ukraine, everything's changed. Uh, they cannot turn back the clock. And uh, the talks between Ukraine and Russia are 
not helpful because Ukraine is not an independent country. They do what the U.S. tells them to do. So in the absence of the U.S. Uh, being involved in, in any sort of negotiation and being open to not getting what it wants, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, we forget the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved when the U.S. compromised. So uh, the U.S. had put missiles in Turkey, which neighbors the Soviet Union. And so the Soviets said, well, we could put missiles next door to the U.S. So guess what happened? They took missiles out of Turkey. Nobody talks about that. But that crisis was averted with compromise. Uh, but I think we have an administration, not just this administration, but a country that for 30 years now is used to getting its way in the world. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so they and, and they have gone out on this limb. You have a, unless we forget, Biden was the Ukraine point person uh, under the Obama administration. And he brings back all these people, Victoria Nuland and Blinken and all these horrible people who uh, um, uh, engineered the, the 2014 coup. And they're stuck in this, uh, I believe, their own fantasy world of what they think the world ought to be like. So they are, are both frightening to me because I don't think they can, they don't want to extricate themselves, first of all. And I don't think they know how because they cannot accept uh, that the world is uh, changing. I, I think in the short term, people in Ukraine are going to continue to suffer. It's very tragic, it's very sad what they are um, going through now, uh, thanks to the United States. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it is thanks to the United States because Ukraine was already in a pretty rough spot before Russia decided to intervene. It was already under the thumb of the IMF and having its economy plundered and privatized. And it was already in the midst of a civil war, which had taken thousands upon thousands of lives, most of them in East Ukraine, but really creating an untenable internal political situation, one that is very convenient for the US and NATO to exploit for their own ends. And I do believe that there is a possibility for an agreement to happen in the relative near future. It seems like the talks get more and more frequent it seems that at least publicly, Ukraine's side is more and more willing to say that they are willing to listen to security guarantees on both sides and come up with something. The The point that you make, though, which is, very, I think, 100% correct, is that the United States and NATO have absolutely no interest in coming to any kind of agreement. And we know that while they may not be directly involved, they, they are actually directly involved. This alliance is yeah. directly involved in whatever outcome occurs because it is Ukraine's government, which is uh, honestly just following the diktats of NATO at this point. And so I think everything that you hear coming out of the United States, everything they hear even from Europe, Europe, which has, I think, much more to lose in the United States. The fossil fuel corporations and weapons contractors <laughs> based in the United States, right? These huge multinationals, they're happy. I mean, they're happy. They're, they are so happy to see this crisis and this chaos occur because it's really good for their own interests in monopolizing the markets and reaping these short-term benefits. But for Europe, it's a disaster because uh, an economic catastrophe is really just right around the bend. And we're already feeling it. All of us around the world are feeling it in terms of these huge price increases and inflation that was already really, really bad. It's only getting worse and worse. <coughs> and so, yeah, I really in terms of the U.S. and NATO's role, uh, you all talk about it at Black Alliance for Peace, right? This full spectrum dominance model, mm -hmm. this policy strategy of the United States, right? The Wolfowitz Doctrine, the uh, center, you know, the sort of project of a new American century. This is still the, the policy of the U.S. military. It's still the policy of Western imperialism overall. And that means that there is no room for diplomacy and negotiations. Even during the Cold War, right. diplomacy and negotiations were actually a critical feature of the Cold War because yeah. the United States had to save face, right? It had to save face amid domestic movements, right? Movements that were happening 
in the United States itself and around the Western world for improved working conditions uh, against racism, Jim Crow and exploitation. Mm -hmm. There was a real need to have a public face as this democracy, right, that actually engages with the world as a leader of the free world. Now, all of that rhetoric, all it really means is that the United States is seeking to project its military uh, domination around the world. And it has not shown the capacity to negotiate for many, many, for really the last, since the Soviet Union fell, yeah. we can see under Obama how much the Obama administration, while there were some, you know, there was the uh, Iran nuclear deal, there was some pullback around some of the most heinous parts of, let's say, the pivot to Asia. But at the same time, there was still this push to war. There was the coup in Ukraine. There was the coup yep. in Honduras. There was so much strife. Uh, there was the war in Syria, the bombing of Libya, right? There was still so much escalation that I can't imagine under a Joe Biden administration that there will be some sort of curtailment unless the tables turn so much globally that the United States' hand is forced. And that in and of itself changes history, as you said. It changes history for good, really. I, that's the... That's kind of how I see it. And with Russia, right, Russia conducting this military operation, they themselves really changed the course of history. And you saw it in the minds of Americans and Westerners who just, they kind of lost it, right? The vast majority, oh. even people on the left were just like, all right, I guess that anti-war, that peace uh, movement, all that stuff, you know, progressive politics, left all that, that's gone. Uh, we're, we're, we're on board for... Uh, whatever imperialism well, has you, to well, say. Well, you know, it's a uh, it's funny we because we've had this conversation before, most recently with uh, Dr. Montero about what what is the left, and and we know that it's it's small. We have a lot of liberalism, but not mm -hmm. a lot of true left wing uh, politics. And you see it when there's a crisis and this hysteria, this madness. Uh, you know, when I saw the story about Russian cats can't be in the cat show, I thought it was the onion. I really, but to find out that it was actually true and Tchaikovsky was canceled. And um, so you have a, a people who are really devoid of ideology, uh, who can't even, you know, look after themselves, can't even say to themselves, wait a minute, how much money has been pledged to Ukraine in the past two weeks? It's something like $15 billion. And we're told they can't, they can't continue the child tax credit. You can't have Build Back Better. Everything, anything that benefits the people is, quote, unquote, too much money. Um, and But, of course, that's the purpose of uh, war propaganda, right? You don't want people to stop and, and think. So whatever you know about Ukraine or imperialism, you should know about your own well-being and how um, it's being violated by the government in this effort. So I would hope that people could bring themselves to at least look after themselves and uh, ask themselves questions about how this is impacting them, how, how this is impacting uh, their lives and their, um, and their communities. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's really scary to me to see this level of, uh, I, I can't bear to read the corporate media. I mean, I know you have to know what they're saying, right? You, you can't just be ignorant of what they're saying, but it's just, um, it, it's actually terrifying to me. They're just making up things about Russia. Uh, and I think we have to talk about censorship and, uh, um, you mm -hmm. know, YouTube just getting rid of RT and uh, uh, other platforms, getting rid of RT and Sputnik and, um, uh, people being kicked off of uh, uh, platforms. It's a it's a bigger discussion, I know, but um, it's uh, 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 some people are now censoring themselves in order to be a part of these platforms. Well, we're using one now, aren't we? So mm -hmm. um, it's a, a very interesting moment. It's uh, been something I've personally been obsessed with for the past three weeks. I, I know you have. Yeah. As, as well, but I think the the role, the goal of the left must stand up. We must plant our flag. We must not back down. We must continue to to uh, talk about imperialism and oppose imperialism. 
uh, and um, to engage in political education so that people are not confused and and don't see um, or, or think of themselves, you know, Russia's imperialist, so I shouldn't care. And instead of, you know, this um, the, this very important picture of how uh, uh, U.S. and NATO have created this this terrible crisis. So the left has to stand fast. Those of us who do get it can't give up. We have to keep getting it. We have to do what we're doing right now. We have to engage in political education. Um, we have to say that, um, you know, the as you mentioned, a no-fly zone. The hashtag should be no no-fly zone. And uh, to get people thinking about the consequences of failure here, uh, the consequences of um, uh, war between nuclear powers. So this is as uh, um, uh, bad as things may look, this is a moment for us to stand up and uh, for us to prove that uh, we mean the things that we've been saying and writing all these years. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is a moment of reckoning. And I, I can't imagine how anyone could not be obsessed if you're on the left, if you're on the real left, if you're an anti-imperialist, if you're yeah. a, a revolutionary, if you're of a political tendency that sees the need for massive social transformation in the United States and, and in the Western imperialist orbit, I can't imagine how you couldn't be obsessed with this moment just because of how rapidly things are changing and how while none of us really predicted that this was going to happen in the moment that it did, we now have the opportunity to attempt our best in our best way the writing of history and the making of history because that's what's happening, right? Regardless of what you think of what Russia did, I mean, Russia, by doing this, is saying, no, history will not just be written by the U.S. and NATO. It will not just be written by those who claim that they have some sort of hegemonic hold on this world. Russia said, no, we have a lot of interests that aren't being met. And we've sat by for a really long time and allowed a lot to go on. And a lot of that was because the, the, there, there were just so many considerations. And now, you know, this is it. Like, this is, this is what we have to do to to gain our security guarantees to have our sovereignty be respected i mean this is this is the limits of the international uh, order right of the this un international system is being challenged right now because for how long since 1945 these Bretton woods institutions all of them have been unable to arrest this very development this creep towards world war three this reemergence of a new Cold War, uh, they have not been successful in doing what they said they were going to do, which is end history, end communism, and then <laughs> we'll have peace on Earth because capitalism will just run wild. And uh, they didn't tell you that capitalism equals war, that capitalism relies on war, and that if capitalism is unleashed, that it will actually just lead to the very scenario uh, that we are in so I, I do think that there are opportunities here especially when it comes to us on the left to continue to increase this internal struggle that we are in right because uh, while neither of us would claim that we were on the sanders end of the political sector or even the squads right neither of us were ever there i mean we were always further to the left on the spectrum but at the same time we understood how important it was to engage with that development. And now we're seeing the entirety of that trend really get on board with this new Cold War, with uh, this anti-Russia sentiment. We see the entire Nation magazine, right? Even before Russia conducted its operation, it was basically becoming an anti-China operation. I mean, I had ran several articles about, na about uh, pieces in the Nation that just regurgitated these new Cold War talking points. And one of them, which was supposedly this profile of the left's position on China by this guy, Dave, uh, David Klyon, he literally talks to Matt Duss, Bernie Sanders' foreign policy advisor, 
who actually calls for sanctions against China, like like that's the left position. He says that we need Magnitsky sanctions on China in order to hold them accountable for human rights. I mean, this is this is where we're at. And then what happens when Russia conducted began its military operation in Ukraine? Bernie Sanders was right out in front, put out a statement and said, we need to sanction Russia and basically starve Russia, right? I mean, this is how, this is how uh, I think just mind warped these so-called uh, social Democrats as Bernie Sanders end of the spectrum really are, is that they really do believe that you can have progressive change in the United States while having a really aggressive posture that they don't even understand is aggressive because they really do think that sanctions is just going to, I don't know, uh, put Putin in his room or something, right? Ground him. <laughs> no, it's not. Actually, all the sanctions are going to do is it's going to destroy or at least hamper Russia's economy. And it will also hamper the global economy, which they always do. And they are now. And so anyway, I just think it's it's a really important moment. To, it is, it is. I'm, I'm, them. I'm hoping that if nothing else, even if people don't understand everything that they should, that the uh, the era of thinking the U.S. can always get its way, it's over, is over. And I hope if people don't know anything else, that they know that there are other forces in the world that can tell the United States, you know, that thing you wanted to do, well, you can't do it. And uh, whether people <laughs> fully understand that or not, um, I, I hope that they uh, realize that, regardless of how they feel about Russia or China or Putin or Xi Jinping, that um, they know the U.S. is not the big dog anymore. I mean, it is uh, still uh, the dollar is still, you know, uh, hegemonic. We, U.S. still has the biggest military, but the U.S. can't get its way all the time. And if people don't understand. If they, if that's all people get, I, I suppose that is progress. But um, uh, those of us who do get it, we we have an obligation, and we have to fulfill it. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, we 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 can end here. Uh, before you all leave, definitely like the stream before you leave. Subscribe if you have not subscribed to the channel. All that good stuff. Check out all the links in the description. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, this multipolar world is an objectively good thing because it does create a different balance of forces, as mm -hmm. we discussed with Dr. Horn. And, and we got to get on board. I mean, you're going to be speaking at this Friends of Socialist China event tomorrow, actually, yes. 12 noon. So I did announce this in a prior stream, but I'll announce it again. So Margaret Kimberly will be speaking at this event. You definitely want to register i believe the link is in the description as well to register for the eventbrite dilma rousseff the former president of brazil will also be speaking she will be the keynote so that would be incredible and the webinar is about china and latin america relations and how they're on the front line of socialism so you do not want to miss that the link is now in the chat so you can also get it there. But yeah, Margaret, do you want to say any last things about, about that event? Uh, I Everybody watch. It's it's going to be, <laughs> it's, it's going to be great. It's very exciting to even be in the same webinar with Dilma uh, Rousseff and a, a list of great speakers. On Monday, I'm doing a webinar with the Ajamu Baraka. We'll be talking about uh, um, uh, Black radical politics and our position on Ukraine. It's this sponsored by San Diego State University. If you uh, check me out on Twitter, you can get the details, Freedom Ride blog on uh, on Twitter, and uh, you can get the info. I'll be posting it again. That's uh, Monday, the 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, and tomorrow's event will be at 12 noon Eastern time. If uh, you have free time on your Saturday, definitely check that out eat your brunch at that time, whatever you do. <laughs> and then check out that Monday evening event. Uh, yeah, definitely follow Margaret Kimberly on Twitter. Get that information. And yeah, no, this was a great stream. Thanks so much for coming on, everyone. We will be back very soon. And yeah, take good care. Peace out. <laughs>